I'm just leaving our office here in Doncaster, heading over to Leeds to the Co-op Academy to meet Jenny Webb, author and uh, assistant head teacher. We're going to discuss a range of topics, and I'm really looking forward to it. So I'm here at uh, Co-op Academy Leeds, I'm with Jenny Webb, Assistant Principal responsible for teaching and learning and other things. Um, Jenny is an author as well, she's a big influence on Twitter, uh, on all things to do with education, I know a lot of what you say on Twitter resonates with many teachers. So um, thank you uh, for having us along here today to school and uh, very good to meet you. It's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you. So uh, just to kick things off Jenny, could you... Uh, Give us a brief overview of, of your teaching career to date and how you've yeah. arrived here at this point in your career. Yeah, so um, I went to a school very like this one, actually only a few, few miles down the road. Um, so kind of normal state comp with a really high level of people premium kids. Um, had a, a pretty challenging childhood in some ways, so a single parent family, low income, ethnic minority, all of those things. Um, so I literally grew up two minutes away from this school. Um, I uh, got a place to read English at Oxford um, from a really challenging kind of place, which was an amazing, amazing, amazing thing to be able to do. What an amazing opportunity. Um, and when I finished my degree, the only thing I wanted to do was go back and teach in Leeds. Um, uh, I worked as uh, worked in an independent school for three years and then got into the state sector, worked as an advanced skills teacher for a year, mm -hmm. then went to another school as a lead practitioner, became head of department there um, and did that for, what, four or five years. And I've been here for 18 months um, as the assistant principal for teaching learning. Um, and it's an absolutely incredible school to work at. We are 85% EAL, significant proportion of asylum seekers, refugees, um, almost 70% pupil premium, but then about 20% on top of that are also technically pupil premium, but they can't be designated as such because they haven't been in the country long enough. Right. So they are doubly hit. So they're living in high, more extreme levels of poverty, but don't go through school meals. So we yeah, have a, yeah. a really, really massive challenge on our hands here, mm -hmm. but it's an incredible place to work. Um, yeah, a lot of people don't yeah. realize that scenario even exists. Yeah, do yeah, so, yeah, okay. yeah, it's pretty amazing actually. Um, so some of our students are, in the country for about 18 months and then they do their GCSE in English literature having only just started learning it and it's incredible what they can achieve and I think one of the things that inspired me to write the book was having been able to apply things that I've used in lots of other schools in very affluent kind of um what's the word I'm looking for privileged kind of settings yeah and then in some other really really challenging kind of schools in West Yorkshire to coming here realizing how much a child who has just landed here from Afghanistan with a really really traumatic history is able to um, access a classic novel from the Victorian period mm. and actually if you keep your standards really really high and you do everything you can um, with really creative pedagogy um, to make sure they can access the text they actually can um, catch up really quickly mm. um, and I think one of the points I make in the book is that obviously English teachers teach two subjects. Um, so English language and English literature are quite distinct from each other, even though they, they have a huge amount of overlap. Yeah. They're distinct in the GCSE and there are lots of very different, um, there's a massively different focus um, in English language and English literature. Language requires a huge amount of fluency and, and accuracy. Mm -hmm. And so it's more difficult for a student who's a new learner of the language to um, to get kind of higher grades in language if they haven't already got their syntax down and their grammar sorted, yeah. tenses and all that kind of thing. Yeah. And that's something that just takes time and exposure to the language. Yeah. Whereas literature, these kids have seen more than probably most of the teachers in my school have seen in their lives. So a child who's moved from country to country to country suddenly has this incredibly um, mature understanding of abstract human concepts. So things like loss and grief and universal human kind of nature, mm -hmm. um, they've seen kind of the best of humanity and the worst of humanity. And when you try and teach a Shakespeare tragedy to a child who has grown up 
knowing that kind of as part of their life, it's, I wouldn't say easy, that's the wrong word, but they have a way in that some of our kids who perhaps were born here don't. Um, and so we have to capitalise on that because if we're going to get these kids anywhere um, in the short time we have them, let's take hold of that yeah. incredible experience and the potential it gives you to yeah. have yeah. some great literary scholars <laughs> um, because suddenly they can see these amazing things <laughs> that most of my friends wouldn't be able to say until they're about 40 because <laughs> they need the life experience, they need a bit more yeah. weight and yeah. wisdom. Um, and I find a lot of the kids I teach are very wise, even if they still make silly mistakes like kids do. It's amazing, really. Brilliant. Yeah. And your uh, your passion is palpable. It yeah, really is uh, yeah. brilliant. Best job in the world. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, we'll come on to your book in a little bit, uh, which is certainly is called How to Teach English Literature. I'm not an English literature teacher, but I found it really helpful just uh, from my teaching background. And I've got colleagues who are physics teachers, RE teachers, who've also read it and found it oh, found wow. it helpful. And I, I'll tell brilliant. you why in a bit and get yeah. your thoughts on that. Um, just a bit more about the school, really, and your experience yeah. here as a senior leader and as a teacher. I've been having lots of conversations with, with teachers uh, in the north of England in the last couple of months. And one thing that's always been really, really high on the agenda is behaviour and their perception that behaviour has got worse in the last few years. And I just really want to get your, your thoughts on that. I mean, I'd yeah. like to challenge it in many ways, that, that, that view. But what are your thoughts yeah, here? I, I would tend to challenge that view, personally. Mm. I think that it is in our nature to think that things are getting worse. Um, I think that sometimes we have to consider um, making blanket statements like kids are getting worse mm. um, doesn't really help anybody because that's nonsense. Kids are not getting worse. Um, Kids, um, so I shouldn't say kids, students, young people, teenagers respond to the environments that they're in. Mm -hmm. I um, think that when I look at my own school and or even the schools I've worked at, um, it's really, really clear that in environments where children feel safe, they understand what the boundaries are. They understand that people there care about them and are invested in them. Mm -hmm. But there are very, very clear consequences and things have been mapped out in those environments. Children from whatever background can succeed. Mm. Obviously there are children that are harder to reach. Obviously there are situations where um, we as adults have to remember why we're there and that it's not about our ego and we have to look at how we react to things in a way that's supporting that young person and sometimes it's a lot harder to get a resolution. Mm. Um, but the majority of children in a school population will respond really, really well to clear boundaries yeah. and <clears throat> principled leadership. And I think that's the key for me. Um, we are an incredibly inclusive school. Um, we uh, make decisions at the highest level which are um, entirely predicated on the needs of the children. And sometimes we have to make choices which, for example, staff would not be particularly happy with because they don't understand the whole picture, but we'll always make the difficult decision if that's the decision that's right for that student. And that might be, no, that child's staying in the general population because that's what they need and that's where they're staying. Yeah. Or this child needs this provision. Um, we have an alternative provision at the school called the Henry Barron Centre. On site? Uh, they are about three minutes that way. Oh. Um, so our teachers drive down there and teach right. so the timetable down there we have all of our specialist subject teachers go down there um it was we were actually inspected in um earlier in this year and it was highly praised as one of the best alternative provisions that we've ever seen right. and the reason for that is that the children who are there are there for the right reasons yeah and they know that we invest in them and we care about their attendance mm -hmm. somebody doesn't turn up and someone is at their house within five minutes yeah um, and they're being better provided for absolutely three minutes down the road with and your staff understand. Yeah. And there isn't a sense of this is this is the school and that's somewhere kids are being babysat for their behaviour. It's not about that. It's about okay. their needs, which go a lot deeper than that. Um, and I think that I'm not the kind of person that has... I, I, I speak to a lot of... I have a lot of friends who are teachers. All my friends are teachers, pretty much. <laughs> but Comes with I, the I, I come across, and you see it on Twitter a lot, you <clears> see this really polarised oversimplification of behavior yeah. and I think it is, it's such a damaging thing mm. and sometimes people need to get off Twitter and remember what the real world is like because as much as I value Twitter because it's an incredible resource and it has done a huge amount for me but 
we have to remember that you cannot have a nuanced debate on Twitter. You cannot fully understand someone's point of view on Twitter. A slight misinterpretation of a word or a phrase or timing or anything on Twitter can lead to a huge misunderstanding and people to take things out of, out of context. There are very few people who are trying to pick a fight, but some people are, and we just need to be wary of the fact that when we talk about behaviour, which is that most complex of things in the education world, they, we're literally talking about human nature, we're talking about why people do things that nobody knows. <laughs> um, and we have to think about um, children who have attachment disorders, we have to think about children who have... Um, Every single experience a child has and every single experience a teacher has, because that's the other side of it. This isn't this isn't just children and a consistent wall. This is children and another bunch of human beings who also have their own baggage. And we have to just calm down and stop polarising the debate. A school that chooses a no tolerance, a zero tolerance behaviour policy has done that for, I believe, really, really good reasons. And I've seen it done really well. Um, in Yorkshire, I know that there are schools in Yorkshire that have a zero tolerance policy and it works really well for them and I believe they're doing it for the right reasons and they're not doing anything horrible and they're not imprisoning children in booths and all that nonsense. If you think a booth is what that child needs and you can justify that to yourself, that's great. And we're not a zero tolerance school, but we make difficult decisions too and I don't think anyone can say this is good and this is bad or this is this is wicked and evil and this is, you know, Nirvana because no school has got it perfectly right and everyone's trying their best absolutely yeah yeah and as long as we are catering for the individual needs of that child then you know and and it comes back very much echo you know what you were saying about if boundaries are clear if your policy is clear and consistently implemented then your children will feel feel safe ultimately and they will well they should flourish absolutely okay and you certainly feel that they're flourishing here that's the hope yeah and our, our kids are incredible and Our children respect the rules that we put in place. They understand why they're there. We have a very um, restorative ethos here. So when children do um, have challenge the rules, um, staff, there's a real ethos here of staff going and having really meaningful conversations with children. A child will just get put into a detention and not really understand why. There is an understanding between the child, the member of staff, there is an attempt to reconcile. And if that doesn't happen, there is support from the senior team to make that happen or the pastoral team to make that happen. And it's about having an understanding and recognising from both sides, the adult recognising that children get things wrong and they often do things that are bonkers for no real sensible reason. And they're just reacting to hormones and all the madness that's going on. Um, And on the other side as well, kids need to understand that adults are human beings and teachers don't always get things right and that that's okay and sometimes that means us taking the ego out and saying to a child I absolutely got it wrong in that lesson I'm so sorry I shouldn't have spoken to you like that or do you know what? I'm having a really bad day can we start again mm-hmm. um that wasn't okay and I actually had a conversation with a student last week along those lines and in in my English lesson um I'm so sorry I just snapped at you and that was awful and that's why you haven't worked for 20 minutes my fault I'm so sorry but you have to be able to do that and if you can't then it's about you and it's not about them and that's ridiculous why are you even here Um, I don't think you can learn that as a teacher either I think you can improve Mm. I think you can be encouraged to reflect yes and I think that teachers who struggle with behavior the best way of developing those staff and what we try and do here is to give those teachers a toolkit to help them reflect on their behaviour in the classroom. Okay. And think think by yourself. I mean, Iris is great for that. Actually. Includes but think, reflecting yeah, back with video. Perhaps. Yeah, absolutely. But even not even video. It can be, right, what's your memory of that incident? Could that incident have interpreted in any other way? Would someone watching that incident have described it in exactly the same way you just described it? Mm. Is everything crystal clear in your mind? How was this said? Where were you standing? Were your fists clenched? Think about... Think about how it went down, yeah. really, because everyone has their own version of the truth in those situations. And it's very, very difficult to get a kid to climb down and apologise if the teacher won't also sometimes. Not always. Often the child just needs to go, all right, yeah, fine, I won't do it again. But in some situations when people know that it hasn't quite been perfect, it can be a, a you can always come together and yeah. recognise. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Um, just to come back to your book, one of uh, the things that I really picked up on as a non-English specialist was your kind of vision 
of um, how we can marry this, this notion of shared planning to lighten the workload yeah. with also doing our own thing in the classroom and, yeah. and teachers having autonomy. Yes. So uh, could you elaborate on that? Yeah, that, I think that there has to be balance. And the same thing that I said about polarising the debate <laughs> around behaviour, I don't think that anybody benefits from having a system where everything is planned to the nth degree and everyone must do, must operate lessons in exactly this way or the complete opposite end of the scale which is actually where I like where I started my training I did my NQT here in a private school which was an amazing school amazing amazing school but I was literally it was like here's the book cupboard off you go um, and that's the extreme other end uh, they let me choose text that no one else was teaching at GCSE and I just they just bought me a class set and I just went off as an NQT being all crazy and full of mad ideas like okay. you know the crazy things NQTs do like <clears throat> building sculptures and stuff like that because that's the same as essay writing um, <laughs> but there has to be a middle ground so I think that if children are going to have a fair deal from that department mm -hmm. and I think this works in every subject if the children in that department are going to get a fair deal, so Mrs next door and Mr on this side of the wall are both doing something that's relatively similar in terms of quality, content, delivery, all of that stuff, then the children are getting a, a roughly fair deal. Mm. You're going to find in a department of, you know, I had my last department, I think there were eight English teachers, and we weren't, not all te not all teachers have thought created equal. There will always be the people who kids think are the best teachers yeah. and people who think are less good in a department so it can't all be the and same be varying and everyone has different styles quality, and, yeah. absolutely yeah. but the point is what i would advocate is for the sake of staff workload and a certain level of consistency there should be some level of basis planning for every scheme of work right so what i advocate in the book is um a system that myself and a colleague called cat lang who is incredible um came up with when we were working at my last school and it was um we had six core lessons for every scheme of work so in english i might see um a class four times a week which means that over a six or seven week half term i'm seeing them a lot more than six times but the idea is that if you have six core lessons which are really beautifully planned well resourced you do a baseline of some description um, and then six core lessons with content the teachers have got something to start with something that sort of sets a standard mm -hmm. like this is the bar and now you can do whatever you want outside of that so my expectation as a head of department would be that you teach the six core lessons obviously take them and adapt them to the needs of your group so in this school the needs of students is so diverse you know we have everything from the inspire curriculum for very 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 top ability students all the way down to kind of beginner EAL kind of step one um, students um, and kind of everything in between mm. and you have to be able to take it and adapt it and make it work for the students in front of you make it work for your style as well there is nothing worse than having to teach something someone else has planned unless you've got time to make it work because not everyone thinks in the same way and I certainly don't I always have to replan things but having that basis there as a starting point is really really important because it's a standard um, it also cuts down your workload all the resources are done so in English all the extracts you're going to use for teaching that half term might be done they might already have the homework planning in place whatever else it is and it means that people have got a balance between uh, nothing at all and everything and we don't want either of those. We want right. like, and that's the harder path to tread. You know, it's much easier to either say, do what you want, or I've done everything for you, you don't have to think. Mm. <laughs> um, it's a much, much harder thing to do as a leader to give people some level of, of autonomy and some level of guidance. Yeah, yeah. I think. So a level of prescribed, yeah. this is what we do. But I'm assuming that if staff want to be involved in the, the creation of those and six core be, lessons. And they, they should be, yeah. and that's really important. So it wouldn't be as a head of department that you would plan all the six core lessons, that's insane. Mm. You would go, right, this is what we're doing in year seven. Um, who wants to do this scheme of work? This. Who's doing this? Who's doing this? And generally pair them up so it's not just one person because one person might be a fantastic planner, but two heads are better than one, three heads are better than two. Yeah. Why not get as much in as possible? Um, I would actually <clears throat> advocate having... Um, a really experienced member of staff with an NQT mm -hmm. or people with different styles yeah. or people who don't normally work together or people who um, have different specialism areas. So if you've got someone who's a modern poetry specialist who loves the beat poets and someone who loves Renaissance tragedy, that's helpful mm -hmm. because they have a different way of looking at things. So, Brilliant. Yeah. OK.
Okay, thank you for that. Very well elaborated upon. Uh, Sorry, uh, I didn't ask you that. What else? There's something you mentioned there about, um, you know, this perception or reality that, that, that sometimes students feel like they're getting a rough deal because they've got such and such a future. Uh, and that's definitely something that I think has become more prevalent in the last 10 or 15 years, certainly in my teaching career and those of my friends that are teachers. This, I suppose, students becoming more powerful yeah. and indeed parents, sometimes yeah. to an unreasonable degree. Yeah. Um, so, for example, in your book you talk about uh, marking and feedback and the fact that, just as one example, pupils shouldn't feel that, you know, expect every piece of work to be marked, uh, to be marked well, yeah. or to be marked at all. Yeah. Uh, you know, where's this idea of uh, doing work for the sake of doing work and taking pride in it? Mm. I, th I think there has, there's certainly been a shift in the teaching profession about how we look at marking and feedback, which has been very, very needed. Mm. Um, from this idea that everything should be marked and a really good teacher is someone who's just got red pen all over the page and all that kind of thing, um, towards kind of looking at impact and looking at what actually works and mm -hmm. looking at children being the ones who produce something and the act of production, the act of writing is where they get most of the benefit, the act of yeah. doing the work. And that's really, really, I think the thing we need to kind of, in order to manage student expectations and in order to manage parental expectations, it's about communication and it's about educating them. Mm -hmm. I tell my students all the time what the research is. If I'm asking them to do something that they don't want to do, if I'm asking them to do something that's new, or if I'm saying I'm trying to convince them that no, I don't need to mark that piece of work or this is more important, mm -hmm. um, I explain why. So there's no point in me marking this, guys, because you've already had feedback on it. We've done lots of feedback all week and if I mark this now that'll be three hours of my life marking a full set mm -hmm. of books when actually we've moved on and the benefit you've had from doing your final draft was writing the final draft and independently okay. making corrections and it's, it's having that sink and in and don't forget the fact to. you're going to the cocktail bar tonight as well so <laughs> take priority. I just point out that as a mum of a toddler I rarely go to the cocktail bar <laughs> so this isn't um, this is a typical it's thoroughly thing. deserved I'm yeah. sure but I think you know it's, it's something else I talk about in the book is the importance of struggle. And, yeah, I was going to ask and, about that. And a child reading through your marking is not difficult. A child independently going through their work and finding their spag errors is difficult. Mm. A child reading a page that I've already circled all their spag errors and it's taken me There's no seven struggle minutes. there. There's no struggle. Yeah. It's passive. They're passive participants in their mm -hmm. own education if all we do is overmark. And saying that to parents, saying that to kids and helping them to understand why helps you overcome it. I think we need to stop being scared of what parents think and scared of what kids think and help change what they think. Because mm -hmm. in our job, we're teachers. Like, we should just communicate better with the community. Ideally. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I'm aware of time and not it's wanting right. to take too it's much right. more of yours. Okay. Um, I'm gonna do something pretty unfair now. I'm gonna spring this Good on friend. you. And it's gonna be difficult for you, Jenny Webb, because I'm gonna ask for one or two word answers. Yes. Okay, okay go. Five quick questions. Well, Question number that. one. Okay. Biggest influence to date on Jenny Webb's career? TikTok. <laughs> um, reading oh. books. In effect. <laughs> Question two. Uh, the most important thing to remember in your NQT year? Don't panic. Okay. Don't panic, Mr. Manu. Mm. Question three. Uh, what do you think is the greatest challenge facing teachers on a daily basis? Time. Time. Question four. One thing the DfE could do to entice more people into the profession? Speak about teachers with respect in the media. Okay, that's a lot of words. But thoroughly uh, agree. Speak about teachers with respect. Okay. And finally, if you had... And I know school budgets are shot to bits. Hilarious. But imagine Hilarious. a scenario where you had fifty thousand pounds spare to spend on whatever you wanted to in school. What would that be? Um, a really intensive reading program. More books. Physical some, books. Physical books. Um, because the children don't. Our children don't have the things to read non-physical books on. 
Um, but yeah, really intensive breeding program. Somebody should administer it. Okay, yeah. thank you very much. And uh, finally, please do tell us where uh, the best place is to, to get your book, uh, How to Teach English Literature, if you could give it a little plug. Uh, so you can get it on Amazon, um, or you can get it from the John Cat website directly from our publisher. Perfect. Okay, thank you very much, Jenny. Enjoy That's your Friday night. My pleasure, night. yeah. Thank you. <laughs> thank you for watching this Four Ends video. As always, we're really, really interested to hear your thoughts, so please do comment below.